done to bring me happy Welcome to a Captain's Log, the Star Trek talk show set to bring you through the past and future of Trek. It's been a week since our first episode went live, and it's time to deliver episode two directly into your head. We bring an open communications channel to everything Star Trek. Our show is a great way to introduce Star Trek franchise to children or teens and for new fans of the 55 years of everything Star Trek. I'm sure our audience and the great bird of the galaxy, Gene Roddenberry, are thrilled that you gave them your Android overkill introduction, Raj, but thank you. You've officially been demoted to my co-co-host. I like Coco, at least the smell. Unlike humans who break their fast to wake up consuming chocolate infused with vitamins, I don't have to eat pebbles made of cocoa with milk to have chocolate milk in my cereal for senses to activate. But thanks for the offer, Bass. You're off base. We're not talking about cereal. Ugh. It's not an offer. It's a second co-host that you are. You know, my mistake. There is no cocoa in an additional sidekick host. You look more like you'd enjoy Lucky Charms. <laughs> but that's a whole other topic. Triple cereal actually is the choice I would make. There's three flavors. But I'm sure you want to introduce your human science officer host here on the ship. She's fictionally fashioned with Science Blue and a Trek technical manual as my number one host for you. This is Lily. Welcome to a Captain's Log. Thank you, Brian. Let me start out by saying, It's Lily. For our non-Klingon speakers, I'm Lily, and I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I love it all, and yes, even Enterprise. Our friendly android Raj and I are here to provide you with all the details you're looking for as Brian boldly goes where no fan has gone before. I am truly honored to be serving as Brian's number one in this journey through the vast, beautiful, and ever-expanding Star Trek universe. And thank you for joining us. Brian? You know, we're truly lucky to have you here, Lily. Raj is, well, now my co-co-host. Well, we got a glimpse of new life being breathed into Star Trek in the form of Janeway's mysterious teen companions and the new Star Trek Prodigy series as a cliffhanger in episode one here on A Captain's Log. Mostly it consisted of Raj and I telling our Trekkers about what we know on Nickelodeon's new series straight from producer Heather Caden and all their excitement on the upcoming premiere. It's going to be a blast watching this new Prodigy show with your kids, or even if you don't have kids, to see yet another new way Star Trek's versatility can endure with a completely different rendition of Star Trek for teens and Trekkers alike. Spot on, Lily. Looking forward to Prodigy. So they say no news is good news? Uh-uh. This news is good news. Now that you've been introduced to our fantastic and fanatical co-host, Lily, we've got a second set of new characters to reveal to you that Star Trek Prodigy just recently unveiled. Oh yeah! Let's name Prodigy's cast of characters. Um, Lily. Mevyap. Let's try that again without being interrupted by Raj. So, the names of Prodigy's cast of characters are coming onto your view screen now. Let's take a look at some first images, starting with Kate Mulgrew as Captain Janeway. There she is as a hologram and in cartoon form. Familiar look, but looking good. So cool to see Kathy back, as Q would call Janeway. Now these first looks are so crisp. The 3D animation, it's going to be cutting edge animation at its best on Nickelodeon. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Lily, but I'm just so excited to hear the rest of the cast. What you got next? Well, two of these characters are familiar races. One is a Medusan. You remember when Spock wore those funky 60s square lens red glasses to avoid looking at the Medusan? Oh yes, Lily. It's on screen for you viewers, including these classic Star Trek aliens. Follow along with Lily here. Oh yeah, we all remember the Medusan look, but don't really look. Kind of like we almost peeked inside Pandora's box. If you dare to look, you may go crazy. <laughs> Here we go with the cast. Angus Imri plays the character named Zero. 
a medusin, a non-corporeal energy-based life form who wears a containment suit to stop others from going mad at the sight of themselves. Jason Manzukis plays the character Jankum Pog, a 16-year-old Tellerite who always plays devil's advocate. The Tellerites are back. Actress Ella Purnell is Gwyn, who looks like a dreamer and an explorer. She's a 17-year-old Vau Nakat who dreamed of exploring the stars while growing up on her father's bleak mining planet. Dee Bradley Baker plays Murph, an indestructible bluish blob with good timing and an appetite for ship parts. Hmm, he eats futuristic metal alloys? <laughs> sure sounds like it. Uh, next we have Brett Gray as Dahl, a 17-year-old maverick with a lot of hope. The young actress Riley Alizraki plays Rock Tak, a shy 8-year-old Brakar who loves animals. Now Lily, I don't know if you know this, but I just looked this up and found out that Brakar have never been in Star Trek on television, but they've been in Star Trek novels for years. What? So here they go, they make their television debut. So cool. Yeah. That's more continuity there with that Medusa named Zero and the 16-year-old Tellerite who you named as Jankum Pog. Now, Tellerites first appeared in the 1967 original series episode alongside Spock's dad, Sarek, in the episode called Journey to Babel. Watch that one on VHS. Okay, animated truck just keeps getting better. I like the upside of this prodigy cast. Oh. Yeah, they're smart. Lily, because I know it's new information. Disclaimer, I love Mike McMahon's Lower Decks animation as well. It's chock full of legacy Star Trek. The well-balanced humor with its own perspective of what the younger Lower Decks crew endure is to me just spot on. Star Trek still evokes its great society and philosophical origins. Also, new material referencing those origins is good to tie the series together. Yes, and more to this point, what we can anticipate seeing on Prodigy will be the expectation of comedy, like in Lower Decks, toying with Q, who's bored of Picard on his Chateau Picard vineyard, <laughs> also with Riker and Troy on their own ship taking Boimler. All these nods to these vintage Trek references are ideal, not just conveniently placed. Love that. No doubt about it, Lower Decks' premise from Mike McMahon's mind is a carefully woven balance of comedy and loads of vintage Star Trek references. It's well written to please us fans for the Star Trek continuity that we crave. While Prodigy won't be strict comedy like Lower Decks, it will have its moments to show this comedy side that's clearly worked its way into our fandom 50 years stronger and longer than any other franchise in Star Trek history. Indeed! So your topic last week was Enemies of the Federation. This week's rear view and review topic is Best Villains, our top five. Should they get a second chance? How about a second look? You're correct. A second look for many Star Trek villains years later leads to a second chance for redemption. Khan, Nooney, and Singh from the original series episode Space Seed and the Wrath of Khan film as the most dangerous bad guy in the cosmic OK Corral. Yes, and then years later in a feature film, Khan breaks the box office, making it arguably the most favorite film of all time with Star Trek II. Here's a list of the top five and their supervillain backstory. That's right, Brian and Raj. I've already recorded my log on these vile villains. Yes, it certainly is. Lily, let's start at the bottom with number five. Gull Dukat from Deep Space Nine. Would he be in your top five villain list? I definitely agree. Gull Dukat is an extremely manipulative villain who will do anything to get what he wants in order to take down Bajor and the Federation. A major threat in Deep Space Nine is the aftermath of the Cardassian occupation of the planet Bajor. Major Kira Nerys in command of Deep Space Nine. It is through Kira that viewers learned about the Bajorans, but also the charm for loving to hate Gul Dukat the Cardassian. Gul Dukat is certainly one of the most greatest villains who reprises his role numerous times with a path to one day take back Deep Space Nine for his people and to rule over Bajor and the wormhole gateway that the station guards for tactical and other conceivable strategies. Dukat would enjoy to no end telling Kira and all the Bajorans that Cardassia is for Cardassians, while Bajor is once again his world to rule. 
Gul Dukat was played by actor Marco Lemo brilliantly as a top five Star Trek villain. So let's go right into number four. The Klingon Kang played key roles in many legendary battles. Kang achieved the status of a Klingon Dahar Master, a prestigious title as a fierce Klingon warrior. While in peril, Kang first appeared in front of Captain Kirk, convincing the legendary Kirk to beam his small remaining crew onto the Enterprise. Soon thereafter, intense sword fighting broke out, with Kang and his crew versus the Enterprise, ultimately proving Kang can take over much control on the Enterprise. In an epic Klingon battle, including face-to-face, hand-to-hand combat, Kang's bot leth was shattered during a fierce fight with the albino, leaving Kang mortally wounded, before fulfilling a blood oath, where Kang and Kolot died glorious and honorable deaths. The best Klingon villain. A captain's log returns in a moment. Thanks for coming back aboard a captain's log. What? Wh Why, Why is Nomad, Nomad not in your top five? We know what Captain Kirk did to the first space probe launch named Nomad, the lovable trash can with lights. I am Nomad. I shall return to launch point Earth. That's relevant to my sympathies for another android robot, even if he is a villain. He's my favorite villain. Is it my opinion and my character relevant to this show? Raj, you're relevant, but you're not even official Star Trek canon. Heck, we only brought you on board because I needed an animated Android co-host who knows all things Star Trek, so, so I don't have to go to MemoryAlpha.com all the time to fact check or look at my Star Trek encyclopedia. <laughs> Bass, wow, that one really hurts. But you did create me based upon Dr. Roger Corby and Andrea from the original Star Trek series episode, What Are Little Girls Made Of? Surely that means something in your endeavors to follow the Star Trek story with me, coming alive as the android child of the first Star Trek androids? Raj, spare us the synthetic sympathy you're seeking. It's enough that you're here with us. If I could squeeze those little cheeks of yours or simply hug the stuffings out of you, I would. But you're animated on a green screen here in California. It's just not possible with today's technology, you little tin man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't, don't, don't laugh. OK, back to our rear view in review topic. Best or weakest villains are top five. In a matter of minutes, you lose your humanity, entering a state of disconnect by being assimilated into the Borg. This is beyond terrifying. Well, this character lived out a lifetime of terrorizing civilizations, then robbing humanoids of normal lives by collecting them to work as drones for her. The Borg Queen defines herself as the beginning, the end, the one who is many. I am the Borg. The purpose of the Queen was to bring order to chaos. With the disembodied Borg Queen's blending of the organic and synthetic, very little of her original humanoid form remains. Her face and upper torso were organic, while the rest of her body, including her skull and spinal cord, were synthetic. Ruthlessly, she would do anything to protect the Borg Collective. And whereas drones showed no emotions, the Queen herself did. The Queen would direct psychological tactics of extortion, intimidation, and sheer terror to get what she wanted. The Borg Queen killed 75,000 of her own Borg drones trying to persuade her captured Captain Janeway to give her an antidote to a nanovirus. The Borg Queen. The Borg. The Borg. Oh yeah. No truly single individual existed within the Borg Collective, except for the Queen. Borg were nasty, formidable enemies, and the queen to me is at the top. I also have to say that seeing Seven of Nine become the Borg queen herself, even though it was just temporary, was a true Trek moment of beauty. Oh, yes, that was a great moment in Star Trek Picard for Seven. So, on to our number two villain of all time. As the August 1994 official Star Trek The Next Generation magazine from Starlog Press perfectly published in its second to last issue, number 29, the front page states this of our second best villain, his extremely omnipotent wit and wisdom, Q. This sums up the character brought to life by the highly talented John Delancey. Picard
Picard once described Q as many undesirable words, my favorite being Q the misanthrope. Q is an anti-villain depicted as a rogue member of the Q continuum, a society of godlike aliens who are nearly omnipotent by human standards. Q enjoys misusing his power, putting humanity on trial from his first appearance to his last appearance on The Next Generation. He's appeared in four different Star Trek series, and I predict he will appear in many more. Besides Picard and Janeway's view on him, what's not to like about a manipulative and villainous trickster taking delight in causing mischief and helping save the day? The character of Q was actually conceived by Gene Roddenberry, helping to fill out the events of the Next Generation pilot, Encounter at Farpoint, taking it from a one hour to a two hour running time series premiere. Well, the best anyone can hope for is an explicit and unequivocal commitment to being pranked at any time if you're worthy enough to be in Q's path, when of course he's not bothering Picard. <laughs> yes, Q is one of the best villains. Now, Khan. No single bad guy was as great as Khan, Nooney, and Singh. In fact, actor Ricardo Montalban is probably best remembered for his portrayal of Khan in his Star Trek television and film works. Khan fled Earth on a ship called the Botany Bay, while he and his followers were in biological stasis, only to be found centuries later by Captain Kirk's Enterprise. Ambassador Spock's final scene, played by Leonard Nimoy, stated that Khan was the most dangerous adversary the Enterprise ever faced. Now, Khan attempted to destroy the Enterprise with a warp core overload, almost succeeding while in hand-to-hand -hand combat in his first encounter with Kirk. Much later, on this wasted planet, SETI Alpha 5, Khan hijacks a smaller Federation ship, the Reliant, first officer is Mr. Chekhov, and intercepts Kirk's Enterprise, mounting a devastating surprise attack. There's even an alternate reality Khan, played by Benedict Cumberbatch in the 12th Star Trek feature film. Don't forget about his first appearance in the 1967 episode Space Seed, where he almost slit Dr. McCoy's throat and had the greatest climactic ending to a villain taking over the Enterprise. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. We can shift gears now and talk about the almost top five or revisited villains that should have been or maybe shouldn't have been brought back. Oh, I've got an interesting weakest enemy in the top five. Remember the big dummies known as the Packleds? Yes, they first appeared in the second season of Star Trek The Next Generation in the episode Samaritan Snare. Yes. That was their first big appearance as villains. Their pack-led ship lured the Enterprise away in hopes of stealing Geordi and its technology. Well, the pack appear to have a lower IQ. They were known for stealing from every bit of Star Trek's most popular species when we see a schematic of their ship in the season one finale of Star Trek Lower Decks. The they have so much accumulated technology that they are a threat and keep sending more grappling arms, instead of tractor beams, at the Cerritos, telling Captain Freeman they will pull the Cerritos apart and integrate their technology. Yes, and again, just like the first time in Next Generation, it takes Will Riker in command and Deanna's Betazoid insights to help their ship outgun and outmaneuver the Packleds to retreat. I'm sure many of our Star Trek fans picked up on that continuity tie-in as well in Lower Decks. Yes, you know it's going to happen, where Mariner and Boimler get reassigned together. It would be cool to have them on the Titan together with Riker and Troy for maybe half a season or so. Because both Frakes and Sirtis, Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis, did animated voices for Disney's Gargoyles for a really long time back in the mid-90s. Now, they could do the same for Lower Decks. Just a thought, Lily. Ooh. Yes! August 12th is a date I have marked in my calendar. It's right around the corner! Oh, I miss that banter with Beckett Mariner teasing Boimler. Maybe she'll make an ultimatum to him or Riker to have Boimler come back to the Cerritos. Right on. Ambassador Kreutz to Raj. Raj here. We're still discussing weakest villains. Our top five. Raj, yes, you read my mind with that ESP like Gary Mitchell once had. Okay, tell the viewers how they can send us their best or weakest villains, please. Viewers, be sure to write Brian and Lily about your favorite best villains or weakest villains in any of the past. 
past or current Star Trek series and why they're your top five. So make your comments good so that I or Brian, with a Y, can pick up your email and your comments stand out. If we select your comment, we will reply during the next show and read your top five on the air. So it's a top five best villains and the weakest villains top five. My other... Please put Nomad on your list. I didn't think androids like you or any android had Betazoid-like mind-reading abilities. But Nomad is my number four worst villain. Now you're talking, Lily. Nomad is noted at least. Nomad was a space probe that was in service in the early 21st century. It was built to function as a perfect thinking machine capable of independent logic that could seek out new life forms. This flawed tin can robot was in error itself. It could travel at warp speed and it fired energy bolts. However, it temporarily killed Scotty and wiped Uhura's brain to that of a child. Agreed. It had potential as a good enemy, but made multiple mistakes and was kind of a clunky episode. Even for the great 1960s original series, I still loved the episode, even though Nomad was not the greatest of enemies. Now, fortunately for Scotty, Nomad was able to repair him back to life. Yes, all good points. Let me tell you the next weakest villain before our Raj tries to defend Nomad's aired ways. Poor Raj. <laughs> Well, number three is maybe going to shock you, as it's from the 1970s Star Trek animated series episode, More Tribbles, More Troubles. Okay, so the Tribbles may not be known as an enemy of the Federation, but by definition they are. Look at all the damage they did in the fans' choice of the greatest episode, The Trouble with Tribbles. They're likable, but almost deadly in taking up room on Space Station K7. They're softly an enemy of the Federation. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I like your thought into the triple second appearance and really the first appearance too as a weak villain. So what do you have for your number two? From Voyager's early season one episode, Ex Post Facto, my second weakest villain of the Federation is a Benea alien named Liddell Wren, who is married to an old scientist named Tolan Wren. Yes, if I may interrupt, Tolan Wren was stabbed to death in his living room in front of his much younger wife, Liddell. Yes, Raj, you're right. But as the cookie crumbles, so does the love story for the Benea alien named Liddell Wren. Her one quote, Maybe I kill myself slowly because I don't have the courage to do it quickly. It's straight out of a novel I think I once read. My number one weakest villain in the top five is... The Gorn! <laughs> this epic rubber alien in a spacesuit fight between Captain Kirk and the Gorn is absolutely legendary for its cheese factor, which charmingly makes it original Star Trek awesomeness. Even people who aren't Star Trek fans are aware of William Shatner doing battle with a green-skinned reptile man in the California desert. So fans, if you missed the audiophile characters in episode, well, you deserve a Vulcan neck pinch to knock you out for a nap. <laughs> <sighs> Failed Vulcan attempt. You're not a Vulcan, Lily. It was worth a shot. <laughs> well. But if you get it correct, of course you deserve a dessert from the Food Replicator. This is our Trexcellence Star Trek audio soundbite. Listen up, fans. I must warn you, stepping aboard this vessel is consent to be surrounded by dark abnormalities and the clinically obscene. Uh, how long will it take to get to the spa? I wasn't sure how many books to bring. Do not trouble yourself with the journey. The farm cures all. <laughs> the answer is a Dojin Division 14 officer and Boimler from Star Trek Lower Decks. Ooh. A, <laughs> a tough one, but I'm sure some of our fans got it. Hello, happy, my old friend. I'm glad you've manifested yourself to a human I can depend on to bring me happy. 